Hi, I'm Trisha Lynn, and welcome to the first episode of Crime 1-1, where, you might have guessed it, I'm going to talk about carpentry. Just kidding, true crime it is, of course. Crime has a special place in my heart because I fought it as a professional for 12 years, hence the origin of the podcast name, Ha Ha. And so I've seen a lot of violence and blood and mayhem in person from that side of things, but... Even before that, I've always had a fascination with all things mysterious and notorious and morbid in a true crime realm and just generally in the world. The case you're about to hear about involves a young girl who is babysitting for a family friend one moment and then gone the next. This story starts on a clear, brisk night in the town of La Crosse. La Crosse is a college town that sits on the western border of Wisconsin along the Mississippi River. It's home to three universities, including what is now known as the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. But back on Saturday, October 24th, 1953, it was called La Crosse State College, and this happened to be the night of its homecoming football game against River Falls State College, which drew out many of the residents and lots of visiting alumni. One such resident named Vigo Rasmussen was a physics professor at the college. He was going to the game with his wife and his seven-year-old daughter. However, they also had a 20-month-old baby who they decided to hire a babysitter for. For this purpose, the week before, they had secured the services of the daughter of Dr. Richard Hartley. Dr. Hartley was a colleague of Mr. Rasmussen's and considered a well-liked biology professor at the college. The Hartleys were from Illinois, but had lived in La Crosse for about four years, residing at 1533 Johnson Street. They originally had four children, however, a son had died of polio while serving in the Navy, leaving them with 22-year-old Thomas, who was away at college, 15-year-old Evelyn, and six-year-old Carolyn. Evelyn was a brown-haired, blue-eyed Honor Society student as a junior at Central High School. She was active in church, including singing in a choir, a member of her school's ski and science clubs, active with the youth groups, and was considered quiet, dependable, wholesome, and intelligent. She hadn't babysat in three months, but on this night she was scheduled to babysit for the Rasmussens. Mr. Rasmussen came to pick her up around 6.30, and they took the five-minute trip back to his house at 2415 Heschler Drive. As they were walking out, Mrs. Rasmussen gives Evelyn instructions to put the baby, named Janice, down at 7 o'clock uncovered, then to cover her up at 7.15. They leave around 6.45 and Evelyn perches down in the living room with her school books, completely unaware that danger is lurking right outside. When 8.30 comes at the Hartley home, Dr. Hartley is slightly worried. Evelyn was always good about calling her parents when she babysat to check in and let them know she's okay, but there's been no word yet. Dr. Hartley tries calling the Rasmussen home a couple of times, but there's no answer. So eventually, he decides to take the quick drive over to check on her. When he gets there somewhere around 9 o'clock, the doors are locked and the lights are on, but Evelyn is nowhere to be seen. Increasingly frantic, he rings and knocks and yells for Evelyn for 10 minutes or so. With no response still, he decides to walk around to the back to check things out, and he finds an open basement window. He slides through it, landing down on a small stepladder settled under the window, and then spots one of Evelyn's shoes lying at the foot of the basement stairs. The basement door at the top is partially open and he sees light streaming through. He runs up to the living room and sees her glasses broken on the living room floor. Her coat, purse, and school books are there, but Evelyn is nowhere to be seen. There's a radio playing very faintly. And strangely, there are mud tracks on the rug and furniture is in disarray. Baby Janice, though, is peacefully sleeping in a crib. Around 9.49, he goes across the street to a neighbor's house to call the police. All available personnel respond, which was about 20 officers. The group canvasses the area around the home and spots a pool of blood about 10 feet from the open basement window. Bloodhounds are summoned to the scene and track a scent leading through the yards of houses on Sisson Drive and about two blocks north along Cooley Drive before the trail ends, indicating that Evelyn was most likely carted away in a vehicle at that point. The police receive information that screams had been heard around 7.15, but dismissed as neighborhood children. But the fact that Mrs. Rasmussen arrives back home and finds that baby Janice is still uncovered strongly supports the fact that those were Evelyn's terrified cries. 
As if you can recall, Evelyn had been instructed to lay Janice down at 7 and to cover her at 7.15. So clearly this attack occurred sometime within that 15 minute time frame and also not that much longer after the Rasmussens left for the game. There are additional bloodstains found on neighboring houses. There was a stain on a garage about 100 feet north of the Rasmussen house, as well as a stain along a wall and at a window well of 2311 Cooley Drive. The owner of that home recalled painting in his basement during the probable time of the crime, yet didn't notice Evelyn, who from the blood present appeared to have staggered along the wall before falling around the window as she's being attacked. Many other neighbors have been present at the surrounding homes, but there were no witnesses. More blood was found on the Rasmussen home, and eventually pry marks were discovered on bedroom windows adjacent to the stain, making it appear that a suspect had first tried to pry the bedroom window open, but found the basement one available instead, which was broken and couldn't lock. The police theorized that the intruder dragged Evelyn out through the door or back through the basement window. I'd say the basement window theory is more likely, given the path they apparently took through the backyards, the blood stain present outside the windows, Evelyn's shoe in the basement, and most obviously the step stool, after which the attacker dragged her along towards Sisson and to a vehicle on Cooley Street, presumably. A later witness identified only as Mr. X at the time would claim that he had been on a porch a block away from the 2311 Cooley House when he noticed a man and a woman walking together right in front of that very home. The woman appeared disoriented, but he attributed it to homecoming festivities and paid it no mind. He and a relative got in a car to head to the game, and as they approached an intersecting street, a 1941 or 1942 Buick sedan approached them from their right at a high speed. From the limited view Mr. X got when they passed, he noticed a hatless guy and a girl in the back seat and another male driving. The girl was hunched over with her head on the front seat, but he couldn't see her face because of glare. He had also noted when she was walking that her pants were cuffed up. Mrs. Hartley confirmed that Evelyn wore her pants in that style. The next morning, October 25th, the biggest search in history at that time commenced for the city. Along with participation from the La Crosse and neighboring Western Wisconsin residents, Many of the college's alumni in town for the homecoming game gave assistance. A Civil Air Patrol covered a 50-mile stretch of sky. At least 1,000 people showed up to comb for Evelyn and for possible evidence. But nothing of significance was found by the time the search ended at dusk. But early Tuesday morning, a bra and pair of panties stained with blood were found under a highway underpass not far from the Rasmussen home. Her parents couldn't definitively identify them as their daughters, but they were similar to the things she wore. Authorities thought that might indicate they had been thrown from the highway by a moving car. Officers focused their attention on recent peeping Tom activity that had taken place in the city. A neighborhood just south of the Rasmussen's home had been known to have frequent peeping Tom incidents for a year. He had been described as a, quote, seriously demented sex pervert known to look in basement windows regularly over the summer. The search became so huge of an undertaking that even filling station attendants were recruited into the effort by way of their jobs. They were in charge of attempting to inspect the back seat and trunk of every car in the county to look for any suspicious signs. Cars that passed were handed a sticker proclaiming, my car is okay. Licensed numbers of suspicious vehicles or those who refused the inspection were reported to police. The Hartleys made continuous pleas for the abductors to come forward with information on Evelyn. They didn't get that, but rather the attentions of a slimy opportunist who claimed he could offer information about Evelyn for $500. Immediately suspicious, the police instead set up a trap with the Hartley's help, and they managed to apprehend the would-be extortionist. Several months after Evelyn's abduction, a new position was created for La Crosse County called a County Crime Investigator, and they filled it with a man by the name of A.M. Josephson, who was a polygrapher and former Army investigator, and a little bit of a character actually. Keeping in mind that this is a very huge event for the town and they're not getting anywhere with leads, they do start thinking outside of the box a bit, which is smart, but maybe a little too out of the box with some of this stuff. A.M. Josephson immediately instituted mass lie detector tests of every male student and male teacher in the city, an estimated 1,750 people. 
The school board agreed to it initially, but after 300 students were tested, they tossed that out. At some point during the searches, a worn pair of size 11 sneakers was recovered and were thought to match the footprints of the suspect. They were recovered on Highway 14 in the town of Shelby. Authorities theorized the foot tread, when muddy, would be identical to a footprint on the floor at the Rasmussen house, as well as dirt footprints on the outside. The second item they recovered was a denim jacket that was within 800 feet of the shoes, and they considered it significant because, and this is a little strange, they believed the blood stains from the Rasmussen home looked like they contained impressions that appeared they could have been made with a cloth with denim characteristics. Another police officer theorized that a wear pattern on the shoes had been worn by someone who rides a wizard motorbike a lot. So then they focused on tracking down buyers and owners and even past owners of these bikes. That surprisingly never panned out. Our next interesting investigation attempt is courtesy of an idea that an impression on the jacket could have been made by someone wearing a belt or harness. The unknown harness in question could have been used by a steeplejack for safety purposes. So now they hunted down steeplejacks. Still no dice. Authorities then started transporting the clothing around to be exhibited in different locations in the hopes that someone will recognize these items. And yet again, we shoot and don't score. And I'm poking a little fun, but some of these ideas do seem a little out there. But I guess it never hurts to try. It was the 1950s, and obviously policing nowadays is supported by a good arsenal of modern technology. Be that as it may, after several years of getting nowhere with random clothes, the county board decided to relieve A.M. Josephson of his services. In 1971, a man named Tommy Thompson tried to confess to the police that he killed Evelyn, but his tales were debunked easily since he had been in prison at the time of her disappearance. Ed Gein was a notorious serial killer who had a thing for decorating his home with objects made with human skin. Not quite my taste, but everyone's different. He was from the area and he was known to have been visiting family members in a neighborhood in the vicinity of where Evelyn was that night. The police did question him eventually about her disappearance, but they ruled him out. As of 1978, the Hartleys had relocated to Oregon where their youngest daughter Carolyn lived. They were uninterested in speaking about their daughter's disappearance at that point as they had lost hope that she would ever be found. Vigo Rasmussen moved from his house shortly after Evelyn's abduction. The authorities seemed to settle on an overall theory that it was meant to be a burglary from the outset, and that the suspect didn't know Evelyn was in the house until they entered. They based that on the fact that a nearby house had evidence of a failed break-in attempt, so they figured the suspect moved on to the Rasmussen's home. Apparently, there was a footprint in the mud right outside the front window, indicating that the suspect may have peered in at some point. Additional footprints indicate he circled the house after failing to pry several windows, but since the basement window didn't lock, he finally made entry there after pulling off the screen. The living room was at the rear of the house. The top of the basement steps would have placed the intruder in a side entryway settled between the living room and the kitchen and put Evelyn right in his crosshairs. Other theories abound as to how many intruders there were. One theory was that it was one man who caught up with Evelyn after she ran out of the front door screaming. He dragged her to the rear of the house, then attacked her with the window screen that he had discarded on the ground to break in, and then swept her into the night. Another theory is that there was a second intruder waiting outside and the one in the basement handed Evelyn out to him. The second intruder may have struggled with Evelyn while the first intruder was still in the basement. However many intruders there were, the authorities at the time seemed confident it was only supposed to be a burglary originally. Well, maybe. Maybe not. Could it actually be the case that he peered in the window and Evelyn actually was visible, so he realized a young girl was there alone and he switched things up? Or maybe this was set in motion even before that. Was he lurking in the shadows when Mr. Rasmussen drove up with Evelyn by chance? Was he still sitting there when he left with his wife a short while later? I myself tend to go with something along those lines, given how quickly he struck after they left. They left at 6.45, and Evelyn did manage to be able to put the baby to bed at 7 like instructed. But I would be willing to bet that it was actually at that very time that Evelyn is attending the young Janice, that this person is already circling the house and preparing a strike. It did take him several tries, and then he had the basement stairs to creep up. 
so that might take a few moments. And then there are screams at 7.15. Then I think back to how the dad noted the radio was playing faintly. Maybe Evelyn was being studious and trying to concentrate on her schooling more than the music. Or did she reach to turn it down, like we all do, after hearing strange sounds somewhere in the house? Did she hear his footsteps creeping up the basement stairs coming for her? As of the day in 2021, Evelyn Grace Hartley has been missing for over 68 years after being snatched out of a house and dragged off into the night as a 15-year-old girl. No trace of her has ever been found.